Well, good afternoon, church family, friends, loved ones, those that are watching us out on YouTube. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I certainly hope you are rejoicing. I hope that you are happy in Jesus. Amen. And I did say good afternoon because it is late afternoon on a Sunday. And I know some of you are wondering, where has the pastor been? Why is he missing in action? Why haven't I gotten my sermon message already? But let me tell you something. I am taking you back today. Y'all remember when uh, the good old days when we would be in church all day long? You would get up on Sunday morning. You would go to Sunday school. After Sunday school, you would have the, the 11 o'clock service. That ran for two, two and a half hour, about 1.30. You were getting the benediction. You would then go get something to eat only to be back in church at three o'clock for an afternoon service. And if you still didn't get your cup filled, you may end up with a 6 p.m. service on Sunday. Yeah, y'all remember those good old days. Well, I'm taking you back today. I'm giving you an afternoon slash evening sermon message. Why? Because God is a 24-7 God. He's just not a Sunday morning God. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let me tell you something. Uh, I, uh, this, this message has been delayed uh, mostly due to technical difficulties. I, I tried to record this sermon twice today. Uh, only for this, the, the camera to stop right in the middle of recording. It took me a minute to figure out that I didn't have any more storage space. So this is actually my third recording, amen, of this sermon today. But God is good. That You know what that tells me? The devil didn't want y'all to hear this message today. But I'm going to press, press, and press. And you're going to hear uh, what thus says the Lord. And I'm so glad that I get opportunity now to come back. Well, I will tell you, I did get a late start this morning, amen. <clears throat> uh, I had been stewing on a passage of scripture all week long. Uh, and when I got up this morning, uh, I wanted to take my time and not feel rushed in bringing this word. Uh, and so I was delayed in my recording. However, like I said, because of technical difficulties, uh, it got delayed even more. And I'm hoping now that I've cleared enough storage space out for me to get through uh, the whole sermon this time without getting booted off. Uh, but uh, we come rejoicing. We come declaring that God is good. And like I said, God had given me a uh, passage of scripture that I had just been stewing on uh, all week long. And uh, when I started uh, preparing uh, my notes and everything, uh, it, it just, it was one of those things that I, I really just want to remind you of how much our God loves us. And I know saying that, that right now it may not feel that way. Many of us, uh, you know, we're still processing this whole pandemic thing. Uh, and I know sometimes it feels like maybe God is punishing us. But let me tell you something. The God that created us is the God that madly loves us. And if the truth be told, he loves us better than anyone else. And most times he, he loves us better than we love our very own selves. And I just want to encourage you today that God is not against you. God is for you. He wants the absolute best for you. Uh, and so uh, we do serve an amazing God. And it's a God that is blessing us and keeping us through every trial and every tribulation. <clears throat> and so this evening, I just want to... Uh, quickly uh, reflect on uh, Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing about Isaiah chapter 55. Uh, I've looked at this chapter uh, many times over the years, and it's got some key verses in it that, you know, we quoted and put to memory. Uh, but God uh, showed me some amazing verses. Uh, the first three verses of uh, Isaiah chapter 55 uh, and, and to be honest, it's the first time I ever looked at these verses in this light. And if I had to put a title on my uh, message this evening, uh, it would be an invitation to contentment, an invitation to contentment. <clears throat> uh, and, and when I think about this, the truth of the matter is, is that um, it's so difficult for us to find contentment today. 
I think that's part of our challenge as Americans is that we are really just not happy. We're not content. Uh, and, and part of it is that we always seem to want that thing that we do not have, right? Uh, you, you know, most of us, when we had opportunity to, to go to church on a regular basis, uh, many of us did not seize the opportunity, but the minute we lost the opportunity, uh, we then started yearning for that thing which we did not have anymore. Uh, but we all are guilty of, of, of chasing things, right? We all are guilty of, of striving for more, you know. I want more money. I want more success. I want more things, more stuff. Uh, I want more attachments. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we all want more. We all pursue more. <clears throat> and it's kind of like the author of Isaiah 55 is asking the question in verse number two, why? Why? <clears throat> he says, why spend money on what does not satisfy? And why spend your wages and still be hungry? So, so the author is asking that question you know, why is it that we keep yearning for more and more and more and we never find those things that really brings us contentment and satisfaction? And the truth of the matter is, even as believers, as Christians, we can kind of get caught up in this, what I call the rat race or the hamster wheel, where we're just constantly going after things, uh, but never really being happy with where we are or what we have. <clears throat> And so I want to really uh, focus today uh, just in looking at these three verses. I really want to focus on a place where we can try and find true liberation and true contentment. Uh, and the thing here is that God is an inviting God. Yes, he is. He's an inviting God. Uh, you know, he's always inviting us. And now that word inviting, it can take on two different connotations, right? I could say this room is very inviting. And what I'm really seeing is that this room is very attractive and very warm and it draws me into it. I can also uh, use the expression, Bob has invited me over to his house on Sunday. And when I use that expression, uh, what I'm really conveying about the word inviting is that something is going on at Bob's house and he wants me to come and be a part of it. But I will tell you in this passage of scripture here, the first three verses of Isaiah 55 here, God is inviting us and he's really doing it in both of those different uh, connotations. Okay. He's inviting us to a place that's very inviting, very warm, but he's also inviting us to be a part of something that is amazing, that is amazing. And so grab your Bible real quick. Uh, you, we still got a few hours of daylight, so hopefully you can find your Bible. <laughs> but grab your Bible real quick and read along with me as we look at Isaiah chapter 55, the first three verses. <clears throat> and it reads thus way. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you have, who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may have life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. <clears throat> now, in these verses here, <clears throat> there's three questions that I want to quickly address. The first question I want to address is, who is invited? Who is God inviting? The second question I want to address is, what are they offered in the invitation? And then thirdly, what is it that they have to do to receive this offering or this contentment that God 
is extending. So let's start with question number one. Who are invited? Who are invited? Well, we find the answer to this right in verse one. And I see two types of people that are being invited. God is extending the invitation. Now in verse one, he says, come all you who are thirsty and you who have no money. So the first kind of person that I see that God is extending this invitation to <clears throat> is the thirsty and broken. The thirsty and broken. Now you may be wondering, well, who is that? Well, that is that person who uh, feel they have nothing. They feel they have nothing to offer. They are, they are thirsty, they are hungry, they are empty, they are unfulfilled, they are dissatisfied, they tried to do this, they tried to do that. They haven't found success at anything that they've attempted to do. They are living on hard times. You know, we say that some people live from paycheck to paycheck, but they don't even have a paycheck to live from, right? These are those that are struggling. And so God is saying, come those that are thirsty, and those that have no money, come. God is inviting you today, if that is your story, the God of heaven and earth is inviting you to come to the banquet table. Now, the second kind of person we see in verse number two. Because in verse number two, here's what it says. It says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy. So the second town of person that I see being invited by God here uh, to an invitation of contentment is that person that does have a job, that person that does have resources, that person that, you know, uh, they can make things happen. They got money in the bank. They, they got health and they've got a job to go to. I mean, this is the baller, right? Uh, this person that, uh, you know, uh, they have things, they can buy things, they can make things happen. But even so, at the end of the day, they are still frustrated. You know, it's like, um, you know, dreaming, chasing, searching, experimenting, experiencing a uh, different job, different uh, car, different house, different spouse, you know, uh, they can buy the finer things in life, new car, new boat, uh, you know, new grill. But yet, even in all of these things, they are still not satisfied. And so God is saying, why are you spending all of your money on things that can't make you happy? So he says, come, come. So two kinds of people here. The thirsty who are broken and cannot pay. And the, what I call the self-sufficient uh, person who thinks that they can pay and work their way to satisfaction. But they continue to pursue things. And they're never fully content. Now the next question uh, that this passage of scripture answers is, <clears throat> you know, what is it that God is offering? He's inviting us to come, but what is it that he's offering us in this invitation? Well, look at verse number one. In verse number one, the Lord says, come everyone who is thirsty, here is water. Now, we know that water uh, corresponds to the need for refreshment, right? Uh, after all, we need water to live. And uh, there is nothing that is more satisfying than uh, when you are dehydrated and a nice glass of water, right? I can remember uh, working outside on a hot summer day, cutting the grass, and I'm sweating. Uh, and when I walk in the house, you know, there's nothing more satisfying than a big, tall glass of ice water. It, it just quenches your thirst, right? And, and so God is saying, come if you're thirsty and I will give you water. Now, uh, 
you know, in scripture, water often symbolizes new birth, new birth in Christ, what we call being born again. Uh, you know, in John 3, 5, it's put this way. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again of water and of spirit. And, and Jesus himself would go on to say, whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. And so water, water here, what God is saying, come you who you are thirsty, uh, and uh, here is the water. What he's saying here is that here is the newness of life. Here is eternal life. Here is salvation. And if we drink of the water God provides, we shall be satisfied. <laughs> you know, David uh, clearly understood this when he was pending uh the Lord's prayer, and he says, he leads me beside still waters. He restoreth or he refreshes my soul. And so this is what God is extending to us today uh, in this contentment that he's given us. He's saying that contentment starts with the living water that saves and quenches a soul. But I also see something else in verse number one. Not only does he in, uh, invites us to take a water, but he also says, come, buy milk. Come and buy milk. Now, <clears throat> we know that milk is essential for healthy growth and it corresponds to the need for ongoing nourishment. You know, I can remember growing up, uh, there was a brand of milk called pet milk. Oh man, and there was nothing like a tall glass of pet milk and some uh, chocolate chip cookies, right? Uh, but we all know that we need milk for sustainment or for nourishment. A newborn baby needs milk to survive, to begin to grow. And so when we look at milk in the context of scripture, it really serves as a metaphor of the word of God, the word of God. Yes, yes, yes. And, and this is what Paul would pull on in the New Testament when he says that, you know, when we give our life to Christ, we become babes in Christ. We are newborn babes. We're spiritual babies. Amen. And Paul says that we need that spiritual milk, which is the word of God. We need the word of God. Amen. If we're going to grow in knowledge and in grace and in faith in God, we need the milk of the word. Yes. And so as we feed on the word of God, amen, we, we are nourished. We are nourished. And so God now, we see here, he's inviting us, amen. If we're going to have true contentment, he's inviting us to uh, not only come alive through the water, amen, but also to be stable and strong with the milk of his word. Glory be to God, amen. Anybody need a glass of milk today? <laughs> yes, but, but I see a third thing that is going on here as well. And the third thing that I see going on here is not only does God invite us to partake of the water, not only does he provide us to partake of the milk, but he says, come and drink of the wine. Come and drink of the wine. <clears throat> you know, now when we think about wine, okay, wine is connected with exhilaration, right? Uh, wine is connected with spirits, the spirits, right? Uh, we know the ABC store, right? Oh, yeah, I know you know about the ABC store, but we go in there and we get our alcohol and, 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 and we can partake of that alcohol and we start to feeling mighty, mighty good, all right? And, and, and we, what we see here is God has said, come and buy wine from me. And I believe what God is really speaking to is this, this reality that there is a child, there is a child inside of every one of us, that God has, has placed a childlike spirit in us. And, and, and so we were created for shouting and, and singing and dancing and playing and skipping and running and jumping and laughing. We were created for that. 
And I can remember in my childhood, uh, you know, growing up around my cousins in South Carolina, amen, we would get up every morning and our parents and grandparents would feed us and then they would run us outside and tell us to go play. <clears throat> and I can remember the days being so long and we would be playing uh, cowboys and Indians and, and we would be uh, playing in the creek, right? And we would be running down the power line. And, and, and we will be raiding uh, uh, the, the watermelon patch. Uh, I didn't say wait raiding, right? Uh, we will be blessing the watermelon patch. Amen. <laughs> yes. And we will be uh, up in the fruit trees. We had the pecan trees. We had the peach trees. We had the plum trees. We had the uh, musky dimes. Uh, and we had the, the blackberry bushes. And, and all day long, we will be out there just having fun. And it seems like life was just created to live and to be exhilarating. Uh, and, and, and I believe, believe that's what God created us and put in our spirit, amen. And, and the text says uh, in the Bible that David danced before the Lord because he was so happy with God. And so here we see God in this verse in Isaiah is inviting us to come and buy wine. You know, and, and so in biblical time, wine was an important commodity, amen, and it symbolizes joy and celebration. You remember Jesus, uh, one of the first miracles that he performed in his earthly ministry was changing the water to wine at a wedding. And, and, and so I, I, I don't think that was happenstance. I think that was what Jesus was coming to offer, uh, a life full of joy and celebration. <clears throat> and so, you know, we can have uh, this joy as our default position. If we live in the presence and the provisions of God, we can have this joy, this unspeakable joy about us. I remember a song many years ago that Richard Smallwood put out, Jesus is the center of my joy. Yes, Jesus, you are the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect, it comes from you. You're the source of my protection, hope for all I do. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Yes. And so we see here in verse one that God is extending to us in his offer. He's extending to us the waters of salvation that can save us. And then he extends to us the milk, which is the word of God that can sustain us. And then he's saying, drink the wine, which is the joy of the spirit. Amen. Because we are now in right standing with the father. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. And so, and, and, and so when we think about this thing, an invitation to contentment. But, but, but I don't want you to miss this here before we look at the third thing that we need to answer here today. I, I don't want you to miss this because in the second part of verse number two, he really talks about the quality and the quantity of the offering that he's uh, giving us. God speaks to the quality and the quantity of the offering that he's making to us today. Listen, what he says in verse two, he, he says, um, <clears throat> he goes on and he says, listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in the riches of food or riches of fares. So what this tells us here is that uh, this word good means uh, uh, what God offers us is of the top quality. It's the top quality. It's the best there is. Now, who doesn't like to go out to a five-star restaurant, right? I mean, we eat fast food all the time. But when we go out to a five-star restaurant, we expect the finest cut of meat. We expect for uh, all of the food to be prepared with the nicest of seasoning and that it's just, mm, it is just 
flavorful to the taste, right? That's why it's a five-star restaurant. You, you are guaranteed to be satisfied with the meal. And so he says here uh, that, that, that uh, you know, uh, eat what is good. But not only that, but he says it is the richest of food, which tells me that uh, not only is it the best of the food, but that there is plenty of it. There is plenty of it. Now, let me tell you something. I love the Golden Corral. Now, I love the Golden Corral not because it's, it's a five-star restaurant, <laughs> right? Uh, but what I love about the Golden Corral is that it's a buffet. And when you go to a buffet, the thing, even if the food ain't the best, the thing that you enjoy about the buffet is that you get to sample everything that's on the menu, right? And not only do you get to sample everything that's on the menu, you get to eat until your heart's content. You don't have to worry about them running out of something because you know there's still a cook, a chef back in the kitchen that's going to replenish the buffet line. And so you can stay there for one, two, three hours if you want to. Hey Amen, somebody, and just eat until you eat yourself into a stupor. And I've been to uh, Golden Corral where I've seen some folks, that, I mean, eyes rolling back in the head that didn't eat so much. Blood pressure dropping so low. Hey Amen. But let me tell you, what I love about it is that on the buffet, you got some of everything. And not only do you have your salads and, and what we call your appetizers, but then you got the main course. And then as if that wasn't good enough, then you got four or five flavors of dessert waiting for you. I'm talking about carrot cake. I'm talking about chocolate cake. I'm talking about pecan pie. I'm talking about ice cream. I'm talking about cookies. Oh, am I making somebody hungry today? That's what I want to do because what God is telling to us, what he's inviting us to today is come to the banquet. And you're going to get the best food there is. And there will be so much of it that you can eat until your heart is content. Oh, hallelujah, somebody. This is the kind of God that we serve. He's inviting us to salvation. And in salvation, what we get with salvation is not only deliverance from our sin, what we get with salvation is not only eternal life, but and what we get with salvation is not only the fullness of joy, but we get it as much as we want and we can enjoy it till our hearts are content. Hallelujah. But there's one more question, amen, that we need to deal with in these verses here. We're talking about the first three verses of Isaiah chapter 55, the first three verses here. We've looked at uh, who is it that God is sending the invitation to, the invitation to contentment to. We've looked at what does God have to offer. Now we need to address, though, what is it that we have to do to receive? What is it that we have to do to receive? You see, <clears throat> note in verse number one here, though, it, in verse number one, he, he says here, uh, you who have no money, come. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Now, this is amazing here. This is amazing here because what God is telling us is that it does not cost us anything. This invitation to commitment and what we get in this invitation from God, it does not cost us anything. It is a free gift from God. The gift of salvation is a free gift. You can't earn it lest any man would be able to boast. So God here is saying, listen, the sacrifice of Christ that assures your salvation is a free gift to you, but it costs God everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we might not perish, but have everlasting life. So it costs God everything, but it doesn't cost us anything. He says, come you without money. Come to the banquet. 
And, and not only that, but what we have to understand is that it's God's amazing grace that makes it all possible. His amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. God didn't have to do it, but he did it out of love. And it doesn't cost us anything because Christ has paid it all. The only thing we need to do is simply receive. But before we can receive, okay, here's what we've got to understand. Before we can receive, the text here says that we got to be thirsty and dissatisfied. We got to be thirsty and dissatisfied. In other words, in order to receive what God's got to offer, we first got to realize that we got a need. We got to realize that we are thirsty and we are dissatisfied with what the world has been offering us. See, the world will attempt to offer you everything, whatever you want. The world will put it in front of you and claim that you can have it. But we have to be honest with ourselves and acknowledge that what the world has been offering us and what we have been feeding on does not satisfy the soul a soul that is thirsty for something more. And, and until we get to that point, we can't receive this invitation that God is extending to us. See, because if you don't see the need, then you won't see the Savior that can meet that need. Amen. And, and, and unfortunately, many of us churchgoers, and I say churchgoers because everybody that goes to church is not saved. Now, I know you find that surprising. Oh, yeah, I know you're scratching your head saying, what you talking about, Pastor? Well, let me tell you something. Everybody that goes to church, at least when the church was open, amen, everybody that attended church is not saved. There are some people that are, they, they're just content with just checking the box. There are some folks that's just content with going through the motion of religion but not really having a relationship with the Father. And so we need to examine ourselves, examine the condition of our hearts and the temperature of our faith. Yeah, I know you're saying, well, Pastor, how do you do that? Well, let me throw a couple of questions at you. How is your prayer life right now? Are you spending time praying to God? Do you even take the time to thank God, bless your food? How about do you take the time at the end of the day to thank God for getting you through another day? When you wake up in the morning, do you thank God for keeping you through the night and allowing you to see a brand new day? How is your prayer life? Not only that, but how is your Bible study life? Are you spending any time in the word of God? Amen. He, he says, come and, and get the milk. Are you spending time, amen, drinking the glass of milk, the word of God? Are you going to Bible study? I mean, Bible study is online right now, so you can, you ain't even got to drive to the church house. All you think you got to do is drive up to your computer and turn on the Zoom. But what's your excuse for missing Bible study these days? How about this? Uh -oh. How, are you exercising the spiritual gifts that God has placed within you? Not only that, are you involved in church ministry or are you saying, well, I'll leave that up to other folks? You know, I, I, there's plenty of people to do that, so I won't get involved. When was the last time you reached out to meet the needs of somebody else? <laughs> Maybe I should say, when was the first time you reached out to meet the needs of someone else? How about your tithes and your offering? Are you still sending in your tithes and offering during this pandemic? Or have you decided that you will use your money elsewhere since you can't go to church and put it in the offering plate? See, all of these things are things that we can look at and examine our walk to find out what our temperature is with God in terms of our relationship with him. <clears throat> so, you know, so the first thing we need to understand is that, you know, we got to be thirsty and we got to be dissatisfied with what the world is offering us. But the second thing that we need to also uh, be aware of if we're going to receive what God is inviting us to today is that we must be prepared to move. 
We must be prepared to move. You see, if you look at these, the, these three verses, the word come is used five times in these verses. He says, come, everybody who is thirsty, right? He says, come to the waters, amen. Then he says, come, you that have no money. He says, come and buy wine and milk. And, and he, then he, he comes, he says, give ear and come to me. Now, I want you to notice that, that there, there is movement here. There is movement here. If we are going to receive from God, we cannot just sit passively, but we got to actively come to God because God would not force himself upon us. But he's always standing there with arms wide stretched. And he says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the kind of God that we serve today. A God that is always inviting us. A God, a God that is knocking on the door of our hearts. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would open up, I will come in and I will dine with them and they with me. This is the kind of God. It's what I call the four step. The four-step dance with God, right? We got to come. We got to buy. We got to eat. And then we got to enjoy and be happy. Oh, glory to God. Who wouldn't take an invitation like that? What somebody's saying, I want you to come. I want you to buy. It ain't going to cost you nothing but buy, eat, and be happy. This is the true meaning of faith in God. Now, you notice in verse 1, he says, come to the waters. But in verse 3, he says, come to me. Why? Because God is the living water. <laughs> Through Jesus Christ, his son, he is the living waters. Amen. He is the milk. He is the word of God. Okay. He is the bread of life. Amen. And not only that, but he is the wine. Yes, he is the wine. And when we partake of communion, amen, we have the bread and the wine. Why? Because we are celebrating. I told you wine is about celebration. We are celebrating the death, the burial, and more importantly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our King. Yes, we have been invited to come to the Father. So, the truth, amen, that confronts us in this beautiful passage of scripture is this. There is no contentment for us if we continue to pursue earthly things. We will never be satisfied with earthly things. We've got to receive the invitation that God has given us in these verses. See, because true commitment, amen, true commitment only comes when we live in the presence and the provisions of God. Yes, that's when we can have unspeakable joy. Yes, glory to God. And so, as I close here, I, 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 I want to reflect again because I believe all of us are somewhere as it deals with this invitation. See, if you are distant from God, if you are distant from God, then you need to come and draw near. Remember, he's a God that has invited everybody. He's invited the broken down, the broken and hearted, the poor, those in poverty, and he's invited the self-sufficient man, the man who's got it all, the man who can make things happen for himself, even, or at least he thinks he can. The wealthy man, he's inviting all of us. But if you are distant from God, if you don't have a relationship with God, he is inviting you to draw near. Now, perhaps you're the one that you have drawn near to God, but you held back from making any transaction yet, right? You know, you, in other words, you, you're just analyzing the deal to see if you want to buy or not. If that is your story this morning, you, you know, you just need to make the purchase. You need to make the purchase today. See, see, why, why come close to God and why analyze God 
and see all there is about him and then walk away and says, ah, I don't think I want to make that purchase. I encourage you, make the purchase, make the deal. It will be the best deal of your life. Now, perhaps you've already made that transaction, right? And, 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 and you've accepted Christ and now you're holding the water and the milk and the wine in your hand, uh, but, but, you, but you hadn't partaken of it yet. Right. You know how sometimes sometimes we can do what we call a window shopping. That's that that's that's coming close and looking, uh, you know, but not making a purchase. It, that's window shopping. And I encourage you to move from window shopping and, and make the purchase. But then some of us, we will make the purchase. And then after we make the purchase, we'll take that item home and we'll put it away somewhere and we'll never get around to enjoying it. But if you are here listening to me today and you've accepted the Christ, if you, if you accepted this invitation to contentment, now I, I invite you to partake, partake of the banquet. Yes, you know, because see, God here, he's not a thing to be studied. He's not a, a, a thing to be studied. He is a person to be experienced. And I want to invite you to start experiencing the fullness of God in this relationship that you have with him. And finally, if you've eaten, if you've eaten of the, the water, I'm sorry, if you've drunk of the water and, and you've drunk of the, the milk and you've drunk of the wine, and if you've eaten at the Lord's banquet table, now I just want you to simply delight, delight in God. Be happy in him. Be content with him. Know that he is more than enough. He's not just enough for this life. He is more than enough. Amen. And, and, and hopefully you can uh, say like the scripture says, you know, you make known to me the path of life in your presence, there is the fullness of joy and at your right hands are pledges forevermore. And beloved, I hope that you can say like I say, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I hope this word bless your heart today. Again, I apologize for the lateness of it, but just consider this here, your supper meal, or maybe even your midnight stack. Amen. But I pray that you are happy. I pray that you experience the fullness of God and all that he has to offer us. And I hope that you will receive the invitation to contentment that God is giving all of us. May heaven smile upon you until we meet again. Amen.